I owe Ty. I'm festive. All right, are we actually ready to go? Mostly? A little bit? Okay, so, are you guys ready to go? Yes. yes. Woo! We're at Nauticon, it's day two, half of us are inebriated. We don't do that here. You guys are good? Okay. I'm just used to getting a nod from the back that says, oh, we'll record your crap maybe. So I want to take a moment to introduce you to Social Engineering Business Into Your Security. We're here at Nauticon 8 in Cleveland, and I lost my remote control already. <clears throat> we are here to talk a little bit about social engineering security into your business. We get trapped in a car and uh, talked for about eight hours and realized we had a whole lot to say about things we think people aren't doing right in information security um, in, in the way they approach the rest of the business. Most of what's being taught right now about how to do information security, whether it's being taught in the ad hoc sort of um, self-congratulatory reach-arounds that are done in various uh, events, not Nauticon, uh, there's the religion problem, which I'm sure you've all heard about from me before. There's the, the new, um, you have to have a post university, postgraduate degree in something in order to understand how to do information security well. Mm, it's pretty much all wrong. Why do, why do I care about this problem? What, what's what's going to happen if we don't? I don't really understand. Someone could like put in the JavaScript and, and say alert hi. Everything. Oh, oh, okay, so we're in security. We understand how this stuff works. Um, if you guys don't know how to do it, um, I can talk to your management and we can get this stuff addressed. Uh, like I said, this is really simple to fix. We can probably just fix it for you if you guys uh, aren't really sure how to do that. Um, how do you want? How do you want to handle this? This is this is really important that you guys get this fixed today. Also, by the way, uh, I know you guys are working on a bunch of uh, other stuff to to get this stuff out to release. But yeah, you know, we, we've we've got a 14-day uh, SLA on any kind of change to code. We're, we're, we can't fix this today. But it's critical. I I was RSA uh, a few weeks ago. Okay. And and. There, there were these uh, new, new products I was seeing down the day. I, I really, I've, I've been thinking we need it for a while, these uh, application vulnerability scanners that you know, look at all the apps that are in production, make sure we don't have any anything really critical, any cross-site scripting or SQL injection or cross-site request forgery, anything that we're putting out there. You know, and, and I, I want to talk to you about, you know, you know, what can we do about you know getting some funds to, to buy some of these products, you know, and, and maybe getting a couple of guys to, to run these on, on any of our code we're putting out uh, into production. You come up with complicated shit for no good reason. Hey, so there's this new security policy, and it's HR policy 8.94, and it just got ratified by the board of directors, and so now you need to change your passwords at uh, a 90-day interval. Network I have to log into. And right, I have, that's right. And I have to have a different password for everyone. Well, and you it, don't want to be insecure. And do we still have to have 16 character minimum for those? Well, or? actually it got changed. It's, it's now 18. And okay. you have to have alpha numeric, uh, special characters. You have to have mixed case. But you can't have more than three letters that are of the same case. And uh, the password <laughs> history will uh, be 24, unless it's an administrator account, in which case it's 60. And uh, you're not allowed to prepend or suffix or uh, prefix with things. So like if your password even though this is really weak, if it were password one, the next time you couldn't do password two. I guess I'm just going to need to buy bigger post-it notes then. <laughs> we're running Windows? Oh, okay. <laughs> And so someone in the audience shouted out, called common sense. The thing is, common sense isn't so common. So seriously, folks, um, we've all got jobs and we'd like to keep them. We say and do goofy things because nothing says information security like performance art. And uh, please understand that this is entirely in fun and be smart. This year we have a, uh, <clears throat> well, a reduced cast compared to what we thought we were going to have. We have Tom Esten. 
Woo! Chris Clymer! Brandon Knight! Matthew Neely. Everybody knows me, I talk too damn much. And we've got some uh, professional bodies over there. Uh, that's Mini Jackie A and Mini Mercurial. Um, <coughs> I want to point out that my daughter, who is, you know, of course she's my daughter, so she's brilliant, figured out that SANS and NASA have a lot in common. <laughs> Not just that they do everything in Florida, but that they're also from outer space. <sighs> Scenario one, the blinky lights are blinding. So, th yes, exactly, the blinky lights are all over this place. I just turned mine off because they were annoying me. Uh, <clears throat> the real problem in InfoSec is that we cannot describe why one set of blinky lights is better than any other set of blinky lights or why our blinky lights seem to get dimmer according to what marketing people tell us. In this one, we're going to look at the business side of doing security. So last year we talked a whole lot about how we could social engineer security into the business. This time we're talking about how we can social engineer some business into the security so that we're not doing these things just because we want to, we're doing them for good reasons. Uh, we might even use business language. In, indeed. Uh, this time around, uh, we've got three people playing parts. We have Chris playing the part of the manager of information security who has a information security related job he needs to get done. We have Tom playing the part of the project manager who just wants to get his project finished. And we have Matt playing the part of the enlightened CIO CTO. This is how you do it wrong. So I, I know we've got this big project coming up where you're trying to roll a lot of new stuff out. That it's internet facing, and I'm I'm really worried about. Uh, I was at RSA a few weeks ago, yeah. and they were telling me all about this this unicorn persistent threat. The unicorn persistent threat. It's it could be in our network right now. There we don't we don't have anything that's really going to protect these applications against that. And we've got to put in a UPT 9000 appliance yeah. to help protect us against the UPT. You know, I, I'm not going to let this project go forward until we get that appliance. I, I, I don't want us to get hacked by the UPT. Uh, hold, on, hold, on, hold on, I'm really confused. I mean, don't we have, like, an IPS and protections in place? Why do I need the unicorn? The, the IPS is not going to protect you against the, the, the UPT. Come on. I, you, I, don't, I don't understand. I mean, it took me long enough to figure out what an IPS is. And now you're telling me we have to have this unicorn thing? So how much is this UPT thing you're talking about? Yeah. It, it, it's only 500 grand. I mean, it's, it's nothing. Yeah. Oh, fi 500 grand? I mean, we're... We have I, budgets. Yeah. We have budgets we have. I've been told, you know, I've, my budget's been cut 5% this year. You know, our, our, our sales are down, our profits are down. You know, what, how am I supposed to be able to, to pay for that? I mean, we're, you know, how, does this, how will this help us make money to make up for that 5% we lost? But what about the unicorns? <laughs> what about I, rainbows? <laughs> What, what, what did the unicorns get in the network? You're not going to have any money at all to buy anything with. Who cares how much it costs? You've got to stop the unicorns. But I don't know what that means. Why can't you tell me what that means? Is, is it like an IPS? Is it like a... Yeah, we have these firewalls and stuff, and we spend yeah. all this money on these firewalls, this AV. I mean, what, you know, what, what does it actually do? Uh, the, the firewalls, the IPS, that, none of that's good for anything anymore. They're not going to oh stop the God, UPT. So we're supposed to take, you know, where are we supposed to get this money from? You know, are, you know, yeah, do, are we going to cut staff to do this? I mean, what, how do you expect us to come up with this? Oh, that, that, that's not my problem. You've just got to do it. We have to have this. We've got to have the UPT 9000. We're going to get hacked. But well, we've never gotten hacked yet. We've never no, been hacked. That, that you know of. The unicorns could be in there right now. It turns out that uh, <clears throat> this conversation happens every single business day in a corporation. I know because I've been an unwilling participant in it as a consul consultant, <clears throat> which is what you guys do now, isn't that? Yeah, okay. And uh, I've also been on the operational side of it where I've got somebody coming to me saying, find the budget, we need to get this thing to get whatever the latest marketing spiel done is. Um, 
luckily I've been out of the APT loop, or UPT if your problem is unicorns. <coughs> uh, the last time I was stuck in it, it was DLP, and uh, I made the suggestion that maybe we should just try using some outbound firewall rules. This was met with derision, uh, because of course we weren't doing outbound firewall rules, that's just crazy. There's better ways to do it. So I know, I know we've been working on this project to, to, to put these new applications out there that, that are internet facing. There's a lot of a lot we've been doing to, to tune the IPS, to protect these, and put in a web application firewall. I'm a little bit concerned about something called the UPT that, that could affect this. Um, there's a lot of tools that are out there. Uh, I've been looking at one in particular that I, that I think would really help us out to make sure that there's not any any unnecessary risk with what we're doing. I, I know it's not part of the, the project plan right now. I know it's not part of the budget, but um, I think if we were able to get this appliance, it would save us about half an FTE worth of time, and it would actually pay for the product and put it into place and allow us to be a little safer with what we're rolling out. <laughs> so how much, how much does it cost? It's 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 going to cost us it's going to cost us a hundred grand for for there's a more expensive version of it but I think I think the a, the UPT three thousand probably would be would be better than not having anything at all like what is what we have now and so for for about that and the, with the cost savings from from the freed up time, employee time um, I I really think it's going to pay for itself and it's we have a more expensive option but I I think this will actually uh, be a more cost effective way to go about it. Now we have these these firewalls, antivirus, you know, all this other stuff we put in place. You know, is, is there anything there that can be removed, or you know, how does that fit into that? Uh, th those are all great things. They're they're doing a lot for us today. They're protecting against specific things. But this these unicorns, they they have very advanced ways of attacking that the the controls we have today aren't always going to keep them out. So what we have is great for a lot of the stuff we're used to dealing with. But this is something new. Um, we need to have something a little more advanced to, to really try to, to tackle it. Uh, so yeah, the firewalls need to be there. Yeah, there's probably a little bit we can do with tuning those and um, freeing up some employee time. You know, maybe they can spend a, a little bit more on that. Maybe some of that employee time could be spent um, working a little bit more with the business um, to, to, you know, with the requirement stage and some of your projects, so you're able to save time on more of them. Well, you know what, Chris? I'm, I'm glad you explained that because uh, I was just kind of worried that you know we were just going to get rid of our existing IPS infrastructure. It took me a while to kind of understand how that technology works, and it sounds like this is going to be a better solution for us, and we may actually be able to save money uh, going forward, which is a win for everybody. Yeah, it sounds like a good win-win uh, all around. You know, to keep the unicorns out. That's good. So, last year we heard a lot of commentary after the fact about things that we did right or we did wrong. What would anyone suggest is a better way to handle this besides trying to be rational about your unicorn-related spending? Light up your fence. <laughs> <clears throat> Mitigating controls are not part of the framework here. I don't think we can do that in this particular scenario. Mostly because we don't pay the CIO anything in this case. <laughs> So, you know, we've got a really simple way of approaching the problem. We can approach the problem and say, buy us our toys. We are petulant children, buy us our toys. And you can see that there's a certain level of uh, religious backing for that one. Uh, and then there's the inverse. The, the way that you go to the business and ask for money is by going to the business and saying, here's how I'm going to spend your money rationally. Here's how I'm going to take as good care with your money as I would take with my own. Here's how I'm going to save you money because there's nothing like telling somebody you need money from them without saying, but by the way, it's going to save money. And the first time around, that's not going to work out so well, because they're not going to believe you. Uh, believe it or not, information security has a bit of a crap reputation, uh, especially around things like saving money and reducing risk and um, making sure that breaches don't happen. So when you have to go the first time, try hard. You're probably going to lose. Um, once you get that first win, it's, it's kind of like getting your first job and there's no way to, to do it other than just keep slogging at it. But once you get that first win, they're going to believe you the next time because you will have done the numbers and you have proven using, oh, I don't know, math and numbers that you actually didn't spend as much money as you said you would and you saved money in places where you didn't think you were going to find it to save. And it's really not that hard to do so long as you're not an empire building, uh, backwards thinking, best practices, person. 
Scenario two, we need to justify our additional controls. In reviewing the plans for a project, we feel that the preventative controls are inadequate and we want to build some additional business process steps. In this case, we've got Matt playing the part of the manager of InfoSec, whining about whatever it is they whine about, <clears throat> Chris as the project manager who just needs to get the project done. There's expectations on the project manager that InfoSec people usually don't care about. And Brandon is the line of business sponsor. So he's sitting out there saying, you know, here's the thing that we do that makes this company money. Because most IT people are completely clueless about what it is their company does to make money. Somewhere there's a widget machine and somebody turns the hand crank on it and dollar bills fly out. Where that machine is and how it works, they have no idea. And this is true in 90 plus percent of organizations I've worked in as a consultant over a decade. It's a pretty sad story, really. Usually you see demands, threaten, retaliation. It's kind of sad. It's kind of playground. It's, well, not the way you should do it. And here's how we usually do it industry-wide. So I know we're, you know, we're in the middle of this project to roll out our streaming music service to the cloud, but we really need to put some additional controls in place so that uh, we'll, when we onboard a new customer, we, we need to add in some additional controls. They're going to add just, just about like 15 days to the onboarding process. So when someone signs up, it'll be about 15 days later, just an just additional 15 days before they can start using the project product. And uh, you know, just really important, we get these, these, these changes in place. It's going to be a bunch of manual reviews. Every single person who signs up, that, you know, we need to review their sign up. We need to review their information. So you know, we're going to need to hire about five more people to it as well. And uh, you know, just to make sure that, that things are just you know, locked down solid there. 15 days. I, we have a, a, a timeline of about a week to finish this project. We've already committed many, many months uh, before this. So why is this just coming up now? Oh, no, no. The, the 15 days is when someone signs up. It's going to take 15 days for us to vet them before they oh. can use it. It's going to take 30 days before we can even finish the project. Sorry, sorry. Sorry for the confusion there. Okay. Do you realize, uh, so we have we, we looked at the, the cost of this. We're essentially going to be making $4 million uh, for the first month. And we, we're about a growth percentage of 10% month over month. Do you realize how much money that's going to set us back? by having to do this. What, what's the cost of all these additional controls as well? And, uh, I, I, the better question is, whose budget is that coming out of? We, we have not budgeted for any of that. Yeah, none of this was included in the requirements phase. I mean, you, you've been part of this project all along. You didn't mention this at the beginning. This is a whole lot of expense you're adding to the project. At the end, does, does this really have to be done? Well, I mean, these, these are obvious requirements. I, I don't see why you didn't even think to include them. I mean, they're... They're, they're so obvious. I mean, I, I shouldn't even need to tell you that they need to be in there. I mean, the fact you didn't even think about them, I mean, that's just, that just blows my mind. Like, how, how could you not think that we need to add this stuff in? I mean, that, that's, you know, the budget, you're, it should be in the project budget. I mean, how could you not think to include that? Chris, help me out. Didn't we actually, didn't have you engage their group since the beginning of this project? Was, did, has this come up before? No, th this has never come up. I mean, th we have a project plan, and, and this isn't one of the things that are on. And I'm just trying to make sure we follow it and get everything done. This this isn't something we said we needed to do. This is this is going to put us, you know, this the project's going to be a lot later. It's going to be a lot more expensive. I mean, I, I'm I, I don't have money to pay for that in my project budget. And, and why well, are we doing this again? You, you, you better find the money. I mean, these are obvious things. How how you cannot think to put them in there? I just I just don't understand how you can even think. To put them in there. These are obvious things. It needs to be done. I mean, I'm, I'm just not going to approve it. If if these aren't in, I'm just not going to approve it. So you need to find some place to pay for it because uh, if not, it's, it's not going to go in. We just won't need to won't need to offer this service because it's it's too much risk. I mean, do you, do you want to get hacked? I mean, do, do you want to get hacked? Do you, you know there are people out there that try to attack us? There are bad guys online which try to attack us, and I'm just trying to protect us from them. Can, can we do a cloud service outside and not involve him? Well, look, oh, dear God, what are you talking about? No, 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 no. Well, we already we are in private beta with this already, so we do have people using this. What? Uh, so are we going to have to go to them and tell them we're delivering? Oh, yeah, no, we're going to need to cut off their access, put them through the 15-day vetting process, and then 15 days later they can start using the service. I mean, that, that's, that, that's got to be like the, you know, that, that's got to be the process you have to go through. That's not going to work for us. We're just going to push this through. 
No, no, I'm not going to approve it. I just, I just won't approve it. If, if, if you guys don't put these controls in place, then I'm not going to approve it. And, and I mean, you're just going to have to find some way to get them in place. I have final, I have final approval. Uh, well, you know what? Then, then if you do that, well, we're going to have a discussion with HR about, you know, inappropriate, uh, not following procedures. You know, security policy number four point three point five six two seven clearly says all projects have to be approved by information security. So if you want to bypass that, you know, then that's that's your own risk there, and you know, it's your own job you're gambling with. But uh, I'm not going to approve this unless we get uh, unless we get all these controls in place. You know, I think if we just went straight to the cloud, we could have this thing done on time. <laughs> The cloud is dangerous. It's dangerous. Why don't you guys see that? You know, there are hackers in the cloud. You know, you go to the cloud, there, there are hackers in the clouds, and, and it's just, it's just, just, there are unicorns. Do you realize how many unicorns there are that, 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 that are in the cloud? There is a recent SAN survey of cloud providers, and they found that four out of five cloud providers were infested with unicorns. There, there were no unicorns in the scope of this project. Look, if you, it, do you, have, have you ever seen what a unicorn can do to a bit? Once it gets inside, what it can do to a business, I mean, it's just, it, it you know, it will be on the front page of all the newspapers. I mean, look at, look at all the stuff that's, that's occurred. Do you, do you want to, you know, be on the front page of the New York Times as the latest unicorn attack victim? No. No. There are better ways to do this, but this is how the conversations go. They're not using unicorns, obviously, but it's the same problem every day. There are better ways to approach this. <clears throat> Sane ways that include facts and not whatever weird fantasies people have about advanced persistent unicorn threats. Here's a better way. So I know we have this project coming up where we're going to be moving our uh, streaming music service to the cloud. Yeah. And um, you know, there's some privacy regulations that are coming down that are, that are going to impact us. Uh, not right now, but uh, in 2012 they're due to go in place. So what we need to do is come up with a plan so that uh, over the next year or so we can start to gradually move in the controls needed to meet those requirements. Because uh, if we, we are compliant with it, it could be up to $100,000 per violation. Okay. And uh, you know, so we need to just plan for that. But the key is, you know, we have some time before that occurs. Oh, okay. You know, these regulations don't go into place for another year, so we can get the beta in place, start having people using it, and then we'll just need to gradually put in some future projects to uh, move in those controls to make sure that uh, you know we meet those requirements. And how does that impact our, our current timeline, Chris? Can you help me understand all this? Well, if I'm, if I'm understanding right, it doesn't sound like it should affect our, our current timeline at all, but we, we may have to get some budget for some additional projects over the next year, the next two years, to you know take care of these extra requirements, but, but we're not going to add them to what we're doing right now. We should still be able to finish on time. Okay, if it's going to be a year or two out, that gives us some time to go back to my management and talk this out. And um, it, it, Would you be able to come and uh, meet with us as well as my management to kind of address what you guys are looking for and what the overall risk is? Yeah, of course. So we're working on right now a uh, you know some project plans so we can figure out what the total cost would be, what the timeline would be. I uh, know we'd be definitely happy to uh, you know talk with you uh, you and your management about them to help you understand them and uh, talk through the plans to make sure they you know they make sense and fit in with your future rollout okay. schedule as well. Perfect. Yeah, we're already working on the next revision of the site. Uh, we've got a lot of features and things that we're adding, so uh, maybe we can work together on putting a lot of those controls into the next phase of our project. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds great to me. I think we're all on the same page here. Yeah, absolutely. It doesn't take much to go from something that ends in a screaming fight, which happens way too often. Uh, if it wasn't for the mute button on most conference calls, <clears throat> I would be having HR issues. Is there anything that you think we could do better? How many people think that uh, it's a very limited amount of time until most information security departments start scanning corporate MasterCard or Visa cards for purchases that have AMZ or Rackspace or other cloud providers on it and start going after those individuals with a policy that's not yet written that says, you don't get to externalize without me? Anybody in an organization that's doing this already? For reals. 
the only way that they have figured out to find these horrible people that are sidestepping you know, proper business processes that should take a few months to years is going through their financial side records and saying, oh, I found out how you're doing that thing that you're doing so well that's making our customers so happy. You're doing it by skipping all of our internal stuff. You're creating a black IT department. Um, I guess that's StormCloud. I'm not really sure. Yeah. Oh, hey, I know you. Isn't pen testing supposed to find things like that? Well, <clears throat> in my years of experience as a pen tester, I'd say we would never have found an externalized situation because um, when we were doing reconnaissance, we would reconnoiter, that's actually how you say that word, um, for how their DNS was pointing, but we would only pen test approved IP address ranges. Uh, and I think much in the same way that I would be rather loath to pen test against IP address range that looked like it was .mil, even if it was on the list of IP addresses I should check, um, I'm not going to attempt to pen test against Rackspace or Amazon until I know for sure that I've got permission and the engagement letter is not going to come just from the customer. There's going to be an engagement letter from them as well, from the cloud provider that says that uh, the right to audit is being invoked and that I'm being permitted auditing permission on that. Um, it's, it's not a simple problem. It's a problem that I think Nickerson is going to have a good look at in the p-test stuff. Uh, I really hope that he does because it's a... It, the, the weird combination that we're having right now between um, the odd multi-NATs, uh, I don't know if most people are having this problem in their organizations, but we've got not just double NAT, but in some places triple or quadruple NAT, uh, because the RFC 1918 space is smaller than people think because of how it gets used. Um, I don't even know the number of times that we've had to um, have some real long conversations about VPN access uh, because <clears throat> we had some internal stuff on 192.168.1.x, which is the default for anything link sissy or Cisco-ish. And there's weird problems associated with that. Plus, we're running IPv6 in almost all of our enterprises, whether we know it or not. Uh, as soon as you've got a Windows 2008 server and a Windows 7 client, you're running IPv6. And all the stuff that we went through with IPv4 back in 98, 99, 2000, all those particular protocol level breaks, not because the protocol is bad, but because the implementation of the protocol is bad. Uh, we're about to go through all of those again over the next couple of years, uh, especially when whatever the mass migration plan from 1918 to V6 starts to happen. Um, so pen testing is going to get weird and ugly, and it's not going to catch cloud stuff anytime soon because it's going to be too busy with, you know, apple pie and flags and stuff for a little while. Um, as pen testers frankly learn how to do a structured good job rather than, hey, I'm a cool, awesome cowboy and I'm breaking in. Anything else? Okay. Scenario three, <clears throat> awareness program fail. How many people love doing their annual awareness program, annual certification? How many people work in security and have to do it too? How many people work in security and have to do it and find mistakes every year? Yeah. So in this case, uh, we're very, very proud of our new Adobe Captivate-based information security awareness training. Our cast this time is Brandon as the InfoSec awareness author slash InfoSec god who figured out how to get Adobe Captivate to work. This is a non-trivial problem if any of you have ever played with this particular application. Uh, Matt is playing the part of the project manager that's helping to roll out this year's certification across the entire organization of, oh, I don't know, Let's call it 40,000 people. And Tom is one of the early run. I don't want to call it beta test because, well, frankly, everything is in beta these days. But he's one of the first people to have gone through the round, and he's not a happy camper. Here's how you do it wrong. Well, actually, uh, we had uh, Tom here. You know, he's been helping to, to test out those modules, and um, you know, him and actually his his whole department went through it, and um, you know, kind kind of have some concerns. Uh, so Tom was kind of uh, you know uh, uh, brave enough to kind of step forward and wanted to bring some of those issues want bring some of those issues up. I, I got to tell you guys, I failed miserably. I mean, it was probably the worst training 
I have ever taken. I am so lost. I mean, there was stuff in there about crazy passwords I had to remember and, and all this stuff and, and then, like the stuff about unicorns. I'm like, why? What the hell? The like, unicorns in the, in the training? What does that have to do with anything? You had them memorizing NIST standard numbers. Yeah. I mean, like, did. Content in there to get you ready for the test, or do we add more to it? No, what's even worse is my whole team took the training and they failed too. It was just too hard, too complex. I I didn't understand anything. And I have to pass this? I I don't understand. Are you sure you guys are doing it right? You clicked on all the buttons and you you looked at all the videos? No, because you told me not to click on links in the training. And and you're telling me click on the link to go next? I'm so confused. Well, Tom, Tom, how long did it, how, when you did go through the training, I mean, how, how long did that take you? Oh, my God. Like, I mean, the timer was like, it was like two hours or three hours. I don't know. It just took forever. I think at least a day. So maybe that's a problem. You're not, you're not. I just wanted to get it done. I just started clicking through boxes. I mean, what am, what am I supposed to do? You know, for, for compliance and regulations, you have to actually watch and read all this stuff, and then you have to pass the test. That's the point of all this. Well, the, the, everybody else is going to have to do this as well. I don't understand what the big deal the is. The budget we told the line of business, we, when we were rolling this out, we said that it would take an employee about an hour to go through it, and not a day. I mean, these, oh. these, these folks can't afford to have their employees you know, sitting around for, for a day taking this test. I mean, that's, that's going to really impact productivity. You know, we're going to have whole departments that are basically shut down for a day to go through this. Well, if we don't pass this, we're going to have to shut down the entire business. Anyway. I've got widgets to make. My whole team has widgets to make. These widgets are important for the business. I, I just can't waste my time with this compliance training. What, what is this PCI crap? What, what does that have to do with me? Yeah, I, I don't actually know how to answer that either. You don't know what PCI is and you created the test? Christ. So, I mean, we need to find some way to, to, to trim this down. I mean, also, it, it took the folks coding this. I mean, the, the Adobe resources are, are you know, expensive. It took them forever to code it. And, uh, you know, they still have a ton of other modules to go. The stuff that Tom's gone through, you know, took them a number of hours. The whole thing's only supposed to take an hour to go through. And, and still, when he went through it, I mean, you know, Tom's, Tom's a smart guy here. And, you know, his whole department is. And, and, you know, the fact that they got through it and just... You know, failed it miserably. I mean, there's there's something wrong here that we need to we need to go back and adjust. I don't I don't think the problem is with us. I don't understand. And we just fail constantly. That's that's all it is. It's a big bag of fail. So think about some of the non-trivial aspects of that. Think about the initial ask alone. The project manager thought that we were going to go out and ask 40,000 people for one hour. How many people are really good at big math really, really fast? <clears throat> What's 40,000 divided by 365? Or by 200 even, because that's how many working days there are. Yeah, I'm looking at you there. Yeah. Uh-huh. No, you don't know either? It's a lot. We're talking about not just a few years. We're In talking Canada, about a lot of years. five work days? That's... Yeah. Um, I, <laughs> I work at a bank. See, you guys are consultants. I remember those days, a holiday every other week. (laughs) Yep, you got it right. Uh, We're talking about literally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years worth of person time being spent doing the one-hour version. And we're not blinking at saying, well, it's probably going to take you a day. I mean, our, our compliance training just rolled out recently, and if you do it the way they tell you to do it, it will take you four hours. Um, There are 37,000 employees in the company that I work at. Um, that is a huge amount of time. That's almost as much time as is spent inputting texts to American Idol. <laughs> Serious waste of cognitive resources. So there's lots of ways to do it wrong, and I would say it's almost always being done wrong. There are some ways to do it better. So um, Brandon, uh, Tom's group, as you know, they've been doing some of the, the testing on the, on the modules, just kind of run through the program. Get a user's perspective on it. You know, do you help us? Uh, you know, refine it. And you know, Tom's group, I and mean, they went through it, and, and they actually ran into a lot of problems with it. Uh, you know, taking a lot of time, uh, and, and they found you know the questions at the end were just uh, really pretty hard. I mean, Tom, his team, I mean, they're they're smart folks. They're running into problems. So with that, you know, we just wanted to kind of bring everybody together and kind of talk out the issues. See see if we can kind of come up with a 
a solution, get everybody on the same page, and uh, come up with a solution to keep this project on track. Still get the training out that's needed, but also, you know, make sure it's something that, that's useful to our end users. Okay. Yeah, we've been hearing that, uh, been hearing that feedback a lot, and uh, I think we, we kind of got the, uh, we got a new toy, and it was shiny, and it had a lot of things and stuff that we could add in there, so we kind of went overboard with that. So uh, we're looking at kind of scaling that back. There's a lot of lengthy videos that you have to go through, and there's a lot, a lot of content that, um, may not actually be pertinent to all people. So uh, we've taken that feedback and what we're doing right now is we're actually looking at scaling back the amount of content that we're putting in front of people so that uh, it really is, is the key elements that we need to cover for all employees. Uh, and that should take uh, ideally 15 to 20 minutes to get through. Well, that's good to know. And, and it sounds like you're going to start focusing on like why we need to do these things during the training. So why do I need a complex password? Why do I why do I have to worry about these unicorns? Why do I have to why are these things important to me? Because that's what I want to see in the training. That's right. So as as part of our uh, regulations and compliance that we have to, to comply with, we actually have to have this training. So uh, we have um, a certain amount of things that we have to to go over. We're going to try and, and put as much detail as to how it's relevant to your job in there. But what we're actually going to do is, uh, is, after the fact, we're going to try and start to target individual groups and cover best uh, practices or, or cover things for security uh, to make things, or why security is relevant to their job, uh, such as how to... Uh, PCI. How to like, what, what is... Passwords properly, how to, you know, for example, how do you exchange data with other financial partners uh. securely? Uh, we'll, we'll go into some of those things and give you some guidelines on how to do that. So that's where that PCI compliance thing comes in, right? We are, yes. That's yeah. why I need to be PCI because well, I exchange credit card numbers with my bank, for example. Is that what you mean? Sure, that, that's, that's kind of it, yes. Yeah. So we, we are beholden to PCI, hmm. and uh, uh, that's, that's a standard. But beyond that, we're actually... We actually have a standard and a set of framework and policies that uh, if we abide by those, those will far exceed what's set by PCI. So while we will be PCI compliant, we're actually not working towards that as the goal. We will just become PCI compliant by all the rest of the, the framework and policy that we set in place. Hmm. Well, that makes sense to me. Okay. Well, I'll relay that to the team when we take the test again, and you know, hopefully we can provide you some other feedback. Great. Thank you. So what can we do then to, you know, Help you with your project, keep it on track. You know, I know that you know you you have a uh, 20 different balls that you're juggling. You know, is there something that you know I can help you out with in terms of managing the project to help speed that up? Yeah, we'd really like to, to hear from the rest of the users that have been beta testing this. Um, what what type of issues they're running into? If you could kind of collate that together, and then we'll work at uh, restricting or, or peeling back a lot of the, the content that we have here. So again, we have a, a very skeleton set of uh, training. Oh, excellent. Yeah, I'll just go on to uh, our cloud based survey monkey and get a survey out and send it out to all of our users. It's kind of sad, but true how simple that could do. It's since the audience is now waving their hands madly, go. Okay, so repeating the questions so that everybody can hear it. Um, hey, great, we're all convinced. We're going to go back to our organizations and try to convince them. Maybe we can convince one other person. How do we convince the next person? Without launching into song, uh, <clears throat> if you can find two people to believe in you, <laughs> deep enough and strong enough, believe in you. Yeah, it, the well, Muppets really lead you to everything. They teach you how to cooperate. They teach you how to make somebody believe in you. It sounds stupid. It really does. And, and you know, you're probably shaking your head. Uh, you are actually shaking your head. It's really, really easy to get people on your side if you come at it from the standpoint of humility and from the standpoint of trying to do your best and knowing that you're falling flat on your face every damn day. Yeah, if you have two people in there setting the, the tone and attitude for the meeting, it's going to influence other people in there. And kind of, I mean, one thing is if, you know, you're meeting, you know, if it turns into a shouting match, 
if you're the one who's not shouting, you're only keeping calm. You feel like a real ass if you're the guy who's shouting at somebody that's staying perfectly calm, and you know that person's gonna instantly, you know, relax. And it's just a matter of you know putting forward the proper you know appearance and attitude. And if you have two people that are doing that, you know, the third person in the room is probably gonna fall into that pattern just because of the way we interact socially. I mean, similarly, if you have two people in that meeting, which are you know yelling, screaming you know, and stuff like that, then the other person is just going to start doing that as well to, to match that behavior. So self-deprecation goes a long way. Being able to make fun of yourself, being able to say, yeah, you know what, we've been screwing that one up for years. That AV thing, pff, what a joke. It's easy to do that if you're the kind of person who can look at yourself and giggle a little bit. Um, most people take themselves far too seriously. They're deeply invested in their golf shirts. Um, <laughs> One of my most prized possessions, actually, is one of my Sans golf shirts. Um, I asked for an XL, and I got this thing that would fit a refrigerator. Um, <laughs> I think they call that right-sizing. Your uh, non-golf shirt? Well, I don't actually golf. So That's why it's, it's a Sans golf shirt? I got it in Orlando. Isn't that where everybody gets their Sans stuff? Uh, the problem really comes down to one of deep and abiding fail we are doing InfoSec wrong every single day, and it's time we started doing InfoSec right. It really is time. So <clears throat> if anybody remembers ShmooCon, I remember parts of ShmooCon. Uh, one of the big discussions that happened at ShmooCon this year was Nickerson and his uh, penetration testing standards, uh, standard ways of doing the work, standard ways of writing about the work. Uh, I am proposing to this small group to begin with, but I'm gonna get loud and angry about this really soon now when I have some spare time. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, you have no idea. Um, we need people to contribute to doing InfoSec right. Doing InfoSec right is not about penetration testing. It's not about the kind of things that the religions are all about. It's the kind of operational security management stuff that gets us from zero to looking reasonably decent on a regular basis. I'm not aiming for perfection. I'm just aiming for doing some things in a sane kind of way and doing it with a business focus rather than a self-serving focus. Um, I've been ranting for a few years about the religions. I'm a member of one of them, um, <clears throat> admittedly. Uh, the religions exist for one reason and one reason only, and it has nothing at all to do with security. They exist for the next new member. Period. All they care about is that you pay your certification fees. How much is the ISC squared or uh, ISACA getting off of the CRISC uh, grandfathering? Uh, what it was, was recent. Count up to like uh, how many million? Yeah, it was recently estimated by uh, um, what's that guy's name? Alex Hutton. Ah, Alex Hutton. Yeah, that's him. Um, in my head, he's got a placeholder: uh, loud, angry, risk jerkwad. Um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, Alex. Uh, the, the amount of money from this grandfathering program, I don't know if you guys know about this one, but the C-Risk grandfathering, uh, which means that merely by filling out a form. A resume. And adding a resume and adding a check for $500, uh, you can be declared an expert in information risk. That's pretty awesome. Um, they have over 4,000 grandfathering applicants. And they extended the deadline. And they extended the deadline. Because it turns out that people send them checks for $500. And what they do is they send you back a piece of paper that says you're an expert in risk. And they're making millions and millions of dollars this way. Your mic doesn't work. It's up to $2 million that they've made out of that. You turned it off. Um, think about little things like ISC squared and their inability to provide you with a list of who is actually a CISSP. Do you know why? For privacy reasons, you can have yourself removed from the list of the members. So if you're hiring somebody and they say they've got a CISSP, there is no way to validate if that's true, if it's current, or if they are under investigation. Who are they servicing? If you have a CISSP, you should be feeling that service right now. Yeah, and you know, Sands, honestly, they're, they're, they are primed right now to exceed 75 designations. By the time you take into account all the letter and color of metal combinations, it's insane. 
I will not argue they teach. They teach more than the other groups do, frankly, because at least they have a program of teaching. They have a program of teaching that delivers in a lot of, yeah, I know you're smiling, in a lot of different ways. But you know what? They're doing better at the teaching part than anyone else is, even though I think going to Adam Pal Allen Paller University is not appealing. Yeah. Not about Sands. Okay, so the religions suck. When we approach the business, how do we differentiate that we know what we're doing? Okay. You had to bring that guy up, didn't you? Yeah, the world's number one hacker who uh, recently had yet another court case tossed on its head. Um, <clears throat> How do we do something about those people? Well, I think we approach it like any other industry does. Um, we are not doing industry self-regulation. That's acceptable. Doctors do it, engineers do it, teachers do it. They say, here's the minimum bar, and here's what the specialties look like. And this is what the, the membership organizations are trying to do with some amount of legitimacy. There are some serious holes in their plan. I mean, if you can um, boot camp yourself into it and only have to pass the test once, and the way that you keep up your currency is by reading the magazine and writing a test. That's ISACA, by the way. And the currency requirements are so low. It's 120 hours over the course of three years. Um, I'm at something like 450 or 500 hours a year and I get regularly audited as a result because I'm putting way too much effort into my education, according to them. Um, how do we do something about it? I think the beginnings are starting to happen. Finally, we've reached the maturity. I'm, I'm gonna sort of put my virtual arm around Chris Nickerson and say, someone's grown up. <clears throat> I'm just as bad, frankly. Um, I love being a bit of a crazy kid. Uh, we're finally at the point now where we're growing up and we're saying, if we plan to have any legitimacy going forward, if we plan to fix the problems, we've got to start doing it right, and then we've got to find the way to self-organize and do, do things well and do things right. And, and we've seen it happen with some industry organizations, like you know, IEEE tries pretty hard, um, but we need something that looks a lot more like um, the, the professional institutes that are part of teaching and part of engineering and part of accounting and part of law the bar. We need something like that. And part of that honestly means that we need to accept that the field is so broad, there cannot be an information security specialization because there isn't one. I mean, I'm an information security generalist. Every day I have to know everything from ZOS down to iOS, both kinds. And, oh, sorry, that's ZOS? <laughs> You're right. <clears throat> For us, it's Z-O-U-S. Um, the, uh, the, the, the necessity of knowing that much stuff, of being able to operate from layer zero to layer nine is a requirement for me day in and day out. And I don't think there's a way that I could suggest everyone in InfoSec should be like that. I think if somebody is an AppSec specialist, they should be an AppSec, an app, <laughs> AppSec specialist. Um, there, are re there are good reasons for subdivisions. I mean, you, you don't go to the doctor and expect every doctor to be a pediatrician and a gynecologist and an internist and a general surgeon and a neurosurgeon. Like there's, a, there's a lot of specialization in there, but I think there's a general, you know enough about how IT works that you can be part of our club, and I think there's specializations there, and I think that's part of the SANS model that I like. Because, you know, from each of the religions, we can take something good. You know, the, the CISSP is a pretty good, broad education in security. The CISA is a good, broad education in IT and bridging between IT and audit. SANS is, here's what the specialization paths look like, follow one of the specialization paths. So this is all good stuff, but I think it's time that we took it back from organizations that have become self-fulfilling prophecies. If everybody else is okay with that, um, join us. Argue with us. Argue with us on the Twitter. Argue with us on the wiki that I'll get set up as soon as I get it set up. We need to continue this conversation. Um, I'm trying to get the conference back on time again. <clears throat> we started five minutes late. We're gonna finish a few minutes early because we need to have the argument time, whether it's big group arguments or small group arguments. We're heading upstairs to the breakout room. 
If you want to join us, join us. Thank you all very, very much.